And um, with that, we're going to be talking about kind of developing um, perspectives on how we can raise more resilient teenagers. And um, let me let a couple more people in. Hold on just a minute. I had a feeling we might have a few more people joining uh, since this is the dinner hour. So everybody's at home juggling a million things. I, I know that feeling and can relate well. So we will just welcome people as we, um, as we go on. So we're gonna be talking about raising resilient teens. And hold on, we've got someone who may need to mute. Um, so please make sure that you are muting your phones as you come in. If not, I can go ahead and do that. Um, that way we don't hear what's going on in your house and, uh, and uh, all the background noise that comes with that. Okay, so we're gonna be talking uh, tonight about raising resilient teenagers and really supporting and building resilience in adolescent kids in general. And so I'll be coming at it from kind of a dual perspective, helping you understand um, what schools consider, uh, what they're, where they see kids struggle with resilience, but more importantly, how do you just raise a kid who's happy, able to, kind of go with the flow and recover from um, the, the ups and downs of life, because that's what we all need to do, right? Um, we all need to make sure that we are able to um, kind of roll with the punches, deal with things, deal with adversity as they come, as things come up, um, be able to kind of adjust to misfortune as it happens, because, you know, all of us are going to deal with that. And we all know that in our own lives, how important it is to be able to uh, deal with the blows that life hands us. And so that's what we're really going to be talking about today. So what purposes and why is it so important that kids develop that resilience, that perseverance, that ability to per, kind of perse persevere through difficulty, through disappointment, through the adjustments that come at all different ages. And um, so for one, and this is one that we oftentimes will see, academic achievement. We see kids sometimes who really have a low tolerance for frustration and who sometimes can um, develop kind of a uh, learned helplessness or um, a kind of a tendency to give up when things, when the going gets rough. And we want kids to be able to recognize that we all dealt with academic difficulties in our lives and that's part of uh, growing and learning. It's also really important for kids to be able to perse persevere in relationship building because we know that, uh, especially as we reach adolescent, uh, adolescence, the ability to uh, develop friendships is more important than ever. And that doesn't come without its own uh, challenges and disappointments and, uh, and issues of peer pressure that kind of thing as kids get into adolescence. It's also important for future employment success, just the ability to be able to deal with the challenges on a work day-to-day -day basis at work. Every single one of us can relate to that. And especially over the last couple of years with COVID, we had to be able to pivot. We had to be able to uh, deal with the unknown from day to day and be able to adjust to that. Even things like avoiding alcohol and drug abuse, not giving in to uh, peer pressure, avoiding doing things that are going to get you in trouble with the law. So all of those things also in the development of your own talents, your athletic ability. If any of you ever participated in a sport, you know that that requires being able to take feedback. It requires being able to take a loss and still show up for practice the next time. If were in, uh, ever in the visual arts and had your uh, painting or your drawing critiqued by a teacher or uh, in a competition, that takes the ability to be resilient and persevere and take criticism and apply it to become better, to uh, continue developing music, dance, theater, and certainly a lot of our kids had to respond to at some point 
in their life or will at some point in their life. And again, that is going to take resilience and perseverance to be able to uh, handle that. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing for just a moment and uh, take this moment now that we have had the opportunity to kind of get introduced to just welcome everybody who has uh, joined us and ask everybody to please make sure that you have muted your microphone. Uh, if you haven't, you might be getting uh, being part of the presentation and not realize it. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask you to check that uh, to make sure you've muted. I will try to keep an eye on that as well to help you uh, prevent you from becoming part of the presentation. And um, I'm so happy to see so many of us here. So we're, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started again. And um, we will just kind of jump back into the presentation now that we've kind of given an introduction to the topic of what is what do we mean when we say resilience and perseverance. Okay, so what are the traits of someone who is resilient and perseverant? So if your child's teacher or their coach or maybe a friend of the family has mentioned that they think that um, your child could become a little more resilient or needs to persevere more in, in the pursuit of a talent that they have or an academic that's challenging for them. What is it that they mean by that? What is meant by the traits of somebody who is resilient and perseverant that we think are such important qualities in life? So those folks are people that tend to welcome a challenge they're not intimidated by something being a little difficult. They're not worried when the coach changes their position and tells them, I think you've got what it takes to play center when they haven't done that before. Um, they are persistent. So if they have, have a new challenge, they're the one who is not going to give up. They're like a bulldog. When they get a hold of something that they want to accomplish, they're not going to let anybody talk them out of it. Um, they are determined to succeed. Somebody who's resilient and perseverant tends to be motivated to improve. They have what's called a growth mindset, which means I don't necessarily care whether I was born good at it. I'm going to get good at it. Um, they're motivated to always improve. Even if they're good at something, they want to get better. If they're not good at something, they want to improve. They tend to be optimistic people who uh, can see themselves succeeding. They tend to be more decisive and not get stuck in what we call analysis paralysis, um, where we've all known folks who, when given too many, a decision to make, they can hem and haw and think it over a million times because they're not confident about making a decision. And that can really hold kids back from moving on and really uh, self-actualizing and fulfilling their dreams in life. Um, they tend to be good communicators. They are more ability, more able to tolerate the stresses that come with school, with sports, with a job, with family, with relationships. They tend to be more assertive and aren't afraid to say what they need and go get it. They tend to be more flexible. They tend to be more able to see different. And I want to take just a moment to ask whoever has just joined us to just mute their microphone. I can't see them, the participants right now. Thank you. And they're able to see different perspectives. So they're able to look at things from uh, different viewpoints and able to tolerate that uh, and able to like somebody even if they don't agree with them and able to accept a different idea or a different solution than maybe has occurred to them. And they tend to have kind of a fairly upbeat tempo of activity. They stay pretty busy and they're able to handle quite a few tasks at once. So we're all going, oh my gosh, well, we're describing superwoman or superman. And that's true. None of us are perseverant and resilient 100% of the time. We all have ups and downs in our ability to kind of roll with it and um, deal with the blows that come our way. But what there are things that we can do as parents to really enhance our kids' ability to be able to develop those characteristics. So there's one really big myth that I wanna get out of the way tonight because some of you will be thinking that you're coming to hear that we need to praise our kids more, we need to build their self-esteem. Yes, we do, but it's kind of a myth 
that building resilience is all about giving all this unconditional praise and lots of rewards. Because what we're gonna be talking about tonight is helping your kids develop internal resources for being resilient and perseverant. Because actually there's a lot of research over the last 20 years or so that said when we give lots of unconditional praise, like just heaping it onto kids all the time and giving a trophy for everything and praising continually, that it can almost actually increase anxiety in our kids because they're constantly like somebody is always watching me and I have to be perfect all the time. And if I'm not getting praise and, and admiration from somebody, am I doing something wrong? So we want to really enhance our kids' ability to um, feel that internal sense of resilience. And that's about building confidence and competence through a history of positive successful experiences. So that's what really builds a resilient person is having a long track record of knowing I can do this, I can handle it, that uh, I can handle failure and get back on the horse again, that people notice when I do something well, when I work hard at it, and um, that I'm not afraid to ask for help if I need it because I don't have to be perfect all the time. I have grown up with this concept of a growth mindset that I don't have to be perfect. Uh, focusing on progress instead of perfection is really important. And having circles of supportive adults who you know you can go to with questions for support and acceptance and who are gonna be good models of right and wrong and resilience in the face of stress. So we're going to give you some practical suggestions for that uh, through the seven C's of resilience, which were developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2006 and have since become kind of uh, the standard for how a lot of psychologists and family uh, counselors really help parents um, become better supporters of developing resilient, independent, confident, perseverant teenagers. And so those seven C's are confidence, competence, connection, contribution, character, coping, and control. Now, you don't have to remember all those because we're going to go through each one in a little more detail about what does that mean? And more importantly, what are the things we can do as parents to foster those things in our kids? I'm coming from the perspective of, uh, just to give you a little background on me personally, as well as being a, an educator for over 30 years, I also author children's literature that's uh, research based in social emotional learning um, best practices. And I also have uh, grown kids that have flown the nest. So I'm beyond the teenage challenge years. Uh, whew, got through them okay. My kids are 30 uh, and 28 and, and 27 up in the upper age range. So we, I now have grandkids that are toddlers and going into kindergarten. So that's my perspective personally, uh, so that you kind of know where I'm coming from, uh, from a personal perspective. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is control. So when I say that, that we as parents need to help our teenagers gain a, an internal sense of control, I'm talking about an internal locus of control versus external. So I'll give you an example. Um, a student once came to me uh, with an F on their test, okay? And they wanted help um, because they were gonna fail the class if they didn't retake the test. And so my question to them was, why do you think you failed the test? And they said, because the teacher doesn't like me. It was a stupid test. Uh, it wasn't even over what she said it was going to be. The study guide wasn't good enough. Um, lots of external reasons, OK? Another student came to me with the same test, same grade on the same test. And when I asked them, why do you think you failed the test? Their answer was, I didn't study hard enough. I stayed up too late the night before playing video games. I had uh, baseball practice the night before. I didn't study hard enough. I should have asked those questions in class, but I felt stupid asking them. And the teacher asked if we needed any help and I didn't go up and ask for help. It was all about what I could do. That is an example of an internal locus of control. Now, let me make clear that we don't want our kids to be hard on themselves and blaming themselves all the time. What I look at that as, as that's a sense of power. That gives you a sense of power. And for my students who are always about 
you know, it's somebody else, the coach doesn't like me or, you know, the neighbors were being loud and I couldn't concentrate. Whenever you're looking outside of yourself, I would tell my kids, why would you give your control away like that? You just handed your control to somebody else. Uh, and so I would encourage them to take back that control by looking at what could you do differently that might have made a difference. And that is a real hallmark of resilient people. They tend to have an internal locus of control, even though there are external factors that might be having a negative impact on them. They're always focused on what can I do to change the situation? What did I do to contribute to it? And how can I be part of the solution? And that is a really empowering way to feel. So it's also being able to put off immediate gratification. It's being able to say, you know what? I really want that new video game, but I also am saving for college. And so I'm not going to blow this money because I'm trying to save up so that I can get a car that I can drive back and forth to, to classes when I go to college or whatever it is. Being able to put off that immediate gratification for a larger goal. Being able to control impulses is so important because that's what gets our kids in trouble in terms of drugs and alcohol, um, you know, irresponsible sexual activity, um, making poor decisions is often an inability to control that impulse, which we know that teenagers, all teenagers have a hard time with that. It's just part of their wiring. It's part of um, their neurological development that they haven't completely um, developed their executive function, which is this part of your brain that helps you make those critical decisions like being able to control your impulses. Um, but it's something to work on with our kids. Being able to plan something, being able to uh, maybe do chores for an allowance and then saving that money for a desired purchase. Being able to take a huge project from school and break it down into more manageable chunks and meet the deadlines along the way. Um, and developing that interdependence with you as, your, as parents to support their eventual independence. So let me take, talk about that for a minute. We all as parents would love to have like a control button that we push on our kids when they get to be about 12 or 13, where we can really like have final say over every decision they make. But really what we need to be doing is making sure that we keep their relationship with them and our connection, which we're going to talk about in a moment with them as we release some control to them so that they start getting practice in safe ways at making decisions themselves and giving them that sense of control. Because what happens sometimes is our kids are uh, developmentally supposed to be a little rebellious against us when they get to be adolescents, because honestly, if they didn't, start to rebel against us a little bit and resent us for you know, not letting them do everything they want and have those all feelings we all remember as teenagers, it would be absolutely traumatic and heartbreaking for them when they had to leave home. So developmentally, they are wired to start feeling that sense of separation a little bit and questioning authority and resenting <laughs> your control over them. That is completely normal. So one of the things we can do is start giving them some control within safe limits over things that we feel like are appropriate and safe for them to have control over. So they can practice having, having that control and making good decisions, but also so that they can feel that sense of confidence that she or he trusts me to make a good decision. They know I can do it. And that's a really important part of developing that sense of that, that control aspect of resilience and perseverance. So developing that growth mindset too, that I can always improve. That even if um, I was born good at something, I still should have to kind of try to improve what I'm doing. That's kind of my responsibility. Uh, one, one of the subsets of kids who struggle most at college are kids who were gifted, are gifted in terms of their academic ability and have really never had to study much to get by. Uh, throughout their school career. And when they get to college and all the other kids are also really good students and really academically gifted, suddenly they're in a situation where the material is more challenging, the competition is stiffer, and they haven't necessarily ever learned that skill of 
always pushing yourself to improve and do better. They kind of, some of them have gotten used to just doing the, what comes easy to them. So developing that growth mindset, that also means if I'm not good at something, that's okay too, because I can improve from where I am. I don't have to be perfect. Um, so making sure that we're praising what they do instead of what they are. So I'll give you an example. A lot of times we, uh, when a student brings home a report card, even from the time they're little, our first inclination is to say, oh, I'm so proud of you, you're so smart. Well, if I'm praising you because you're smart, that's something that says to you, that's, that's something I was just born with. It's just who I am. It's not something I have to work at. If I say, I'm really proud because I saw you working for that grade. I, I'm so appreciative that you always make sure to get your assignments in and that you study for your tests. Or if we praise a, a student for their success on the athletic field, maybe we say, you know what? You are just a born athlete. That's again, it's a compliment, but it's not really focusing on the on what they've done to accomplish that. And that's really where we need to focus our praise is to say, whoa, you were prepared for that game tonight. You knew your opponent because you were like three steps ahead of them, man. You were all over that field. Being able to give them specific praise that tells them there was something they did that got that amazing accomplishment. That is what really builds your, your children, your teenagers into kids who are focused on what I can do to impact this situation. So another thing you can do is ask questions to help guide their decisions instead of what we tend to default to. I'm, I'm guilty as charged, I've done it a million times as well, which is to say, because I said so. <laughs> do it because I said so. Well, we really need to be asking questions. Well, what do you think would be the best decision? What do you think might happen if? Uh, do you think that would uh, be a good choice? Uh, what do you think might happen next? Uh, how do you think that might impact your other friends? Uh, those kinds of questions that can guide a conversation that help make the wheels turn for them where they can still make a choice. Again, you're going to have to play with what you feel comfortable handing those decisions over to with your, with your teenagers, depending on their maturity level, depending on the situation, but finding opportunities where you can give a little control within boundaries is a really good thing to do. Balanced control, where you still have boundaries set to keep them safe, because teenagers don't always make the best decisions decisions on their own. So putting some boundaries in place for sure, but within those boundaries, letting kids make some choices on their own and support positive risk-taking. You know, we've all been in the situation where our child wants to try out for something that we think, hmm, I'm not sure how that's going to go. I've never seen you really be the kind of kid that wants to get up on stage and act, but we have to be able to, you know, this is an experimental time for our kids where they're trying new things and kind of trying different hats on and figuring out who they are. And that's great when they do that. And to be able to support them in trying something new, and that's what I mean by positive risk taking, not negative risk taking like tr t trying drugs, but positive risk taking like trying out for something they never would have tried out for before. Um, risking failure and telling your kids that you admire them for that and also helping them recover from it when they do, because failure is one of those things that we learn so much from. Okay, the second area that we're going to talk about is confidence. So helping a student or a child become confident, a teenager become confident, does not come from that constant empty praise, that general diffuse praise is what they call that, where we just constantly are saying general things like good job, way to go, um, that kind of thing. We need to be more specific with our praise so that kids really understand what we're praising them for. That we're, we don't need to always be making the child the center of attention because sometimes that actually can raise anxiety. So praising kids for things they can't control, like you're so smart or you're so pretty or you're so talented, sometimes can actually make kids kind of go, yeah, I'm not really that pretty and think that you're blowing smoke. And so it becomes kind of like it doesn't even mean anything to them or 
it can just feel like meaningless almost to them like auditory wallpaper if it's just happening all the time. Another mistake is focusing on perfection because again, a lot of our kids in their teen years become very, uh, th there's something called the spotlight effect that at a certain age during adolescence, kids start feeling like everybody is looking at me. And if I screw up, everybody is gonna notice it. And if I wear something stupid, that's going to be every all anybody notices and they're going to think about it all day and they're going to remember it forever. They think that the spotlight is shining on them all the time and that is not necessarily a positive feeling for a lot of a, a lot of kids. So some of the things that will build confidence though is catch your kids when they're being stars, when they're being good, when they do something great, make sure to mention it. Um, but set the bar for them in the Goldilocks zone. So the Goldilocks zone means that it's just right for them, just the right amount of challenge. So uh, asking them to do things that are gonna stretch them a little bit and gonna be challenging for them, but aren't so difficult that it's gonna be frustrating for them. Make, give them clear boundaries so that they do know what the parameters are on what I can do and what I can't do. So when we are talking about giving them control over things, kids actually feel more confident about making choices when they know that there's boundaries around them so they can't make too big a mistake. So a great example of this was a study I read once of young kids that said, when you look at how kids play on a fenced playground, versus how they play on a playground with no borders. The kids on the, in, on the fenced playground actually try more of the equipment. They do more things. They play in a larger area than the kids who have no boundary around them at all. Because the kids with no visual boundary at all are feeling like they have to set the boundary themselves on how far it is safe to go and they're worried about it. They're anxious about it. Well, the same is true for our teenagers. When they don't have enough boundaries, they feel responsible to make all those decisions about what I can do, what I can't do. And it's anxiety provoking. It's worrisome because they're afraid of screwing up. So making sure that you give those clear boundaries, noticing and praising improvement more than achievement. So again, focusing on progress, not perfection, because honestly, that's where we want our kids to be. We want them improving, not necessarily having to be perfect. Uh, because again, there could be a, a student who, for whom school is not challenging at all, and they might be, be getting better grades than somebody who is really, really working hard and, and devoting a lot of time and effort. In, in that same academic subject or in that same sport. And we wanna make sure to praise our kids for their effort and their improvement. Again, giving genuine specific praise. Thank you so much for taking the trash out without even being told to. You don't have any idea how much that helped me out today. I had so many other things to do. That's an example of genuine specific praise where they can tell I made a difference, not just good job. Uh, teaching our kids that it's okay not to be the best that's hard in our competitive society where uh, everything's about getting the best grade, um, the best scholarship, the best uh, achievement on the field. But we really need to help our kids understand that that's not the be all and end all. Um, teaching that working hard is an asset and praising or complimenting things that are inside that person's control. So rather than, you know, uh, wow, you're great, a great gymnast, uh, say you really earned that ribbon. I know how hard you had to work at practice to nail that. Uh, you really did a great job at that competition today. You stuck that landing and I know how hard it was. And I saw how many times you practiced outside of your regular practice to get that done. Um, giving specific praise about what they did, not an innate talent that they had. So another thing we talked about was that challenge of keeping the connection with our teenagers. And let me tell you, um, the adolescent years were not my favorite time of parenting. I'm, you know, some people uh, might have a very different opinion. That was a hard time for me, 
hard because uh, we were both struggling. I remember once my son, we were having some, uh, my first son, my oldest son was ha had his first girlfriend and we were negotiating all sorts of things about what time you had to be in and whether you could be at her house without her parents there and where you can go on dates and how much time you can spend together and what happens if your grades are going downhill and blah, 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 blah tough conversations and it was getting pretty tense. He was up in his bedroom and um, I remember him saying, mom, you don't understand. I have, I'm not sure how to handle any of this. I, this, I've never had a girlfriend before. And I remember saying to him, well, I've never been the mother of a son with a girlfriend before. So give me a break too. And it was a moment where it could have really gone off the rails because our tension was both getting very high but we had a moment where we just kind of started laughing and realized that we were both trying to figure out the rules here. And we were both struggling with that. And keeping that connection is more important than anything else that you can focus on with your team because they are going to need you to model these things for them, to be there, to set those boundaries for them, to build their confidence, to give them appropriate options, to keep them safe, and to be there when they do inevitably fail, be frustrated, get broken up with, uh, lose out on a scholarship, miss a key deadline, uh, get embarrassed on the field, they're gonna need your support. So primary consideration needs to always be to maintain that positive connection with your teenager. Kids who thrive in adversity over time, and we all have adversity over time, are those who have had adults in their lives who will be there to support them uh, and love them no matter what. And the more connected adults they have, the better. So those kids who have aunts and uncles and grandparents and coaches and neighbors who all are adults that have shown, I care about you, I see you, I notice the great things you're doing, that's every single one of them has an exponential positive effect on them. Um, Again, kids have to go through that rebellion and resistance in order to be able to become independent and be, have the courage to fly solo. And those of you who are first time parents of teenagers um, have the day to look forward to that was one of the hardest for me was taking my oldest son to college for the first, uh, for his move in. And, um, you know, me sitting in the front seat trying to hold it together. And I look back in the rear view mirror and I'm seeing him looking out the window at our house as we drive away and there's a tear sliding down his cheek. And it's just a real visual that I keep in mind when I'm talking to parents about how teenagers seem like they can't wait to get away from you. And yet they really don't, they need you. They, um, they, they are having a hard time growing up and so remember, there's a, a great quote I heard from somebody that says, when you're thinking, why is he giving me a hard, such a hard time? Why is she constantly giving me such a hard time? Try to reframe it as she's having a hard time. He's having a hard time. And it puts you in a different mind space to be able to be empathetic to your teenager when they're driving you crazy, because it's not easy to be a teenager. So I heard a great analogy that I want to share with you. So um, I, I got to hear someone speaking about raising teenagers and they said, avoid being a helicopter parent. So we probably all have heard that term helicopter parent, which means you're kind of constantly buzzing over your kids, watching everything they do and trying to control and interfere with everything they do. And let me tell you, I teach college classes and there are kids at college whose parents will call a professor and try to influence a grade or try to get uh, a college professor to, you know, uh, allow a late assignment or uh, to, you know, argue a case why this kid didn't really plagiarize this. Th even at college, the parents are still helicoptering, buzzing over and trying to control things. And that's not the connection they need, okay? They need to stay connected to you more like you are the lighthouse on the shore, okay? You're not with them constantly. You're not buzzing around them. You are providing a beacon to them so they know where to go for help if they need it. They know where home is and they know where there's help available. They know where there's support available. You are shining the light, 
so that they can see the rocks that they might run into. You are there to give them that support, that guidance, the warnings as necessary, but you're on the shore and letting them go out on their own. And so that's really what we wanna aim for is being more of a lighthouse, less of a helicopter. Another thing to really think about is trying to avoid over dramatic interactions. So we all know that adolescence um, and drama <laughs> go together like peas and carrots. It, they have a lot of drama in their life. And the last thing they need is more drama at home. So avoiding over dramatic interactions with the kids. Try to keep it low key. Try to keep it pretty chill so that because they tend to get very anxious when things get loud and dramatic and ultimatums are given. And um, so when we get our tempers raised, what happens is we are neurologically wired to respond to the emotions of other people. That's just how humans are built. We've all been in that situation when you walk into a room and you go, whoa, I could cut the tension with a knife in here. Well, we're all wired to respond to the, to the emotional state of other people. So all that happens when we get dramatic and over uh, kind of loud and anxious and argumentative is that it creates this situation where the child gets the same, in the same emotional state that we are. And we tend to just play off each other and things rise and escalate in tension. And that doesn't help anybody in terms of their relationship connection. So again, sometimes we always kind of over-focus on independence, but what we really want is interdependence. I am so happy when one of my sons, who's now 30 years old, 28 years old, calls me for advice about uh, how to handle a situation with his four-year-old daughter. I'm thrilled as all get out when, and my husband is too, when one of our kids calls to say there's a hole uh, in, you know, around our, the, the, exhaust fan where the dryer comes out and I'm not sure what to do, who should I call? That shows that we still have a good relationship. Our kids are not afraid to come to us um, when they have a concern. So, you know, and, and also aren't afraid to make decisions on their own. So my stepdaughter uh, recently bought her first house. She did not want to hear one word of advice from any adult in the situation. It was really important for her to do that on her own. But at the same time, when she had to replace her old beater car uh, and is looking for a used car to buy, she realized, whoa, I'm in over my head. I don't know what I'm looking for. And who does she call? She calls dad to help her look for a good used car and make sure that she doesn't buy a lemon. So that's what we want. We want to maintain that connection so that our kids always see that lighthouse on the shore and know how to get home, right? Another really important part. Oh, hold on just a second. I'm not sure how I got my email up there. We don't need that. Let me try to reshare my screen. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. No, I'm still not getting it out of there. Okay, I'm gonna pause for just a moment and see what I need to do. Hold on a minute. This is where technology tends to be so much fun. All right, let's try this again. Darn it, I'm just not having luck with this. Oh, there we go. I'll get it before long. This is where I need to remember who my uh, go-tos for uh, technology are. Hmm. Oops, sorry. Move my bar and see if I can fix it. <clears throat> There we go. You don't need to answer my emails for me. Thank you. So that would be a good example of how a person who's resilient and perseverant doesn't let something like that go, oh no, this is ruining my presentation. It's gonna be a terrible flop. We just deal with it and move on. 
All right. So the next one we're going to talk about is character. So we all talk a lot about um, our kid wanting our kids to have good character. So what do we mean when we say good character? It's knowing what is right, what's wrong and choosing the right thing. We want our kids to be able to control their impulses. We want them to be able to act in ways to keep themselves and other people safe. We want them to think about consequences and how the things, the choices that they have might impact themselves or other people. We want them to be committed to doing well and doing good. So I make that distinction. We want them to do well for themselves, but we want them to do good in the world, right? We want to, to know that they go out there and look at themselves as people who can have a positive impact in the world. We want them to have a good work ethic and, and not cheat to get their way, right? Those are all examples of what we would call good character. So how do we develop that in kids? Um, if we could bottle it, we would make a million dollars, right? And what it basically comes down to is you have to model those things for your kids. You have to model respect and value for others. And that includes them, even when they're being pains in the rear end. You have to be able to model respectful behavior to your teen in order for them to learn that even when I'm frustrated, even when I don't like what I'm hearing, I have to be respectful and value other people's input. Model listening to them respectfully and other people so that they can see how you handle it when you are talking to someone that you don't necessarily agree with. Respect conversations that challenge your outlooks and perspectives, because that's one of the most important things kids are doing at this age is they're questioning things. And that, while it can be maddening as a parent and feel disrespectful at times, like you just need to do what I'm telling you to do because you're the kid and I'm the parent, but them questioning things is one of the most important things that they do to build their persona, their, in, their personal character and who they, who they know themselves to be. And so we want to always make sure that we're respecting those perspectives, even if we don't give in, <laughs> okay? We need to model fairness and justice, model tolerance of dif differences. And part of character is contribution, is being a person who contributes. Um, so there's a myth that I think we all tend to um, kind of buy into that teenagers are very self-centered and focused on themselves and really don't care about anybody else. But that's not really true. Teenagers are really very idealistic people. That's kind of a hallmark of the age. They see issues sometimes as that are wrong and often see better solutions to them than we do because we're kind of stuck sometimes in our uh, perceived notions about things. And kids sometimes ask really good questions and point out things and notice things that we wouldn't. So, you know, the ultimate act of resilience is to be able to ask for help, but it's hard to ask for help if you're worried that you're going to be looked on as like pathetic or pitiful, or I'm always the one that needs help. So one of the best ways to develop confidence in asking for help is also to develop a sense of yourself as somebody who helps others, because then it's not feeling like it's uh, I'm a pitiful, pathetic person because I also help others as well. So it's really important to find opportunities and for your kids to contribute and give back to their community, to their church, to their home, to their neighborhood. Um, you know, people who don't feel ashamed to ask for help are those who feel they have contributed to others. So model contribution, you know, show how you're involved in your community, provide opportunities for kids to contribute at home or in the community, uh, for instance, and give specific praise and appreciation for that. For instance, if you've got younger kids at home, there's nothing wrong with saying, I need you to help your brother with his homework tonight, or would you mind reading a bedtime story to your sister tonight? Or, you know, there's a, a community project at church, would you like to help out with it? Or, you know, I was thinking maybe this Thanksgiving that we could spend a couple hours uh, working at the, at the food bank. Things that can get them involved and see that there are ways such simple and so many ways that I can contribute because that gives you that internal sense of confidence and competence that really builds that resilience. So competence is that feeling like I can handle anything that is given to me, but it's rooted in reality and experience. It's not just about cheerleading and you can do this and rah, rah, rah. It's about, I have had experiences where I know I can handle it. Uh, and so we have to always be providing our kids those opportunities 
to grow and to have the experiences of being successful and also experiences of failure and realizing that you're still loved, you're still admired. And in fact, I'm going to praise you more for having tried something difficult and failed at it and being willing to try it again. I'm going to give you as much praise for that as if you had won the game or won the match or won the blue ribbon or gotten the A. I'm going to give you as much praise for your effort and your hard work and your willingness to take those positive risks as if you had achieved. Um, build on those skills that they naturally possess. This doesn't mean you can't ever compliment somebody for having a natural talent for something, but you really want more of your praise to be on what they do with it and to improve it. Um, developing their areas of weakness. So if there's things that they're not as good at, giving them some the opportunity to practice. And again, giving them praise for being able to work on it, even if it's hard for them. Something we really need to work on in order to keep that connection that we were talking about. So they're always wanting to look for where's the, where's the lighthouse? I'm making sure I stay connected to that. Is that we don't want to tear them down by overcorrecting or, or overprotecting or demeaning them or over-dramatizing. We want to be that that steady in the boat person. Uh, you know, ask them questions, ask them how they feel about things, keep those channels of communication open, have proactive conversations about what would you do if you were at a party and somebody started, uh, you know, offering you drugs and you didn't want to do it, how would you handle that? You know, what would you, what would you think is the right way to handle it? Uh, what's a system we can work out so that you can call me to let me know that you need a ride home? All those proactive com um, conversations, letting kids experiment safely, having control in situations where they're not going to get in trouble, and preventing that fear of failure and give them really modeling how to handle failure. I sure still have plenty of failures that I can talk to my kids about how I handle uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and model that nobody is good at everything. Ask them to help you with stuff that you can't do. I know my kids have talents that I don't have. So ask them for help uh, so that it's not uh, something to be ashamed of to ask for help. Let them see that grown, competent, successful adults ask for help all the time. Try not to compare one child to another in a negative way. Celebrate that unevenness, that I'm not good at the same things that you're good at, and that I'm not good at everything. Some things I'm really good at, some things I'm terrible at. That's what makes me me. Um, so some of the things you can really help them develop competence. And in, in another session this year, we're going to be talking about executive function, which is all those skills that help you have organization and good communication and good impulse control. We also want our kids to be good self-advocates, to ask for what they need, good peer negotiation skills that allow them to kind of get out of a peer pressure situation in a way that keeps them friends with the people that they want to be friends with, um, but helps them get out of it. They need to have good coping skills. So that's not ignoring stresses. It's having effective tools for dealing with stress, being able to take on things emotionally and practically and knowing how and when to escape and remove yourself from stress. A lot of adults are still working on that, right? But have proactive conversations about and support their stress relief activities. If there are things that they do that help them relieve stress, maybe it's a, a membership at the Y, if you can swing it, if that's stress relieving for them, awesome. If they like to go in their room and put on their headphones and listen to music for an hour after school, if that's stress relieving for them, maybe that's something you need to support. Um, if they have another creative outlet and, and you can support it in some way, that's really important. And to tell them, I see how, how happy this makes you and how relaxed you are after you do this. And that's awesome. Talk to them about what you do to relieve your stress so that they can model that from you. And, you know, last but not least in this area, helping kids just build bodies that can handle stress. That means getting enough sleep and eating well and getting some exercise and taking some chill time and not being over scheduled. So many of our teenagers are so busy that they are, they have to be stressed. There's no time to get away from it. So really helping again within boundaries, giving them some choices, but also putting some limits on things so that they are kind of having prescribed downtime, um, whether it's limiting how many seasons they do a sport or limiting how many uh, different 
extracurricular activities they do a single time or whatever it is that you think are good ways to limit that scheduled activity. And just showcasing their strengths, making sure that you know you are showcasing their accomplishments, that you're supporting them by showing up for those important games and focusing on their uh, improvements as well as their achievements, asking them to teach a, or help a sibling with a hobby or with a skill or with homework, um, finding clubs and activities that involve those strengths and interests and showcase them. Um, you know, letting them participate in things that they feel passionate about. I love this, um, this, this uh, graphic that is actually a concept called Ikigai, I think. Um, and it's about finding the intersection of what you love, what the world needs, what you can get paid to do someday, and what you're really good at. And that that really gives you passion and mission and vocation and even a possible profession. So helping kids find the, the activities that are the intersection of things they love, things they're great at, things the world needs, things that could possibly be careers. Those are great things to focus on with your teen to help them explore. So, you know, again, avenues for establishing that sense of purpose is getting them involved in those service projects, encouraging the, their own research into things that they have questions about, modeling your own involvement in, in, in hobbies and pursuits beyond just the regular day, things that you're just doing because you love doing it. Let them see that you embrace those things in life too, so that they are people that grow up to see themselves as, oh yeah, adults have fun too. Adults take guitar lessons. Adults go uh, participate in a, you know, intramural softball league at their work or their church. Keep that positive relationship more than anything else. That's something that you really need to make sure that is your number one priority so that as your kids do grow up and start preparing to leave the nest, that they're seeing you as that lighthouse on the shore, not the helicopter over them, but the lighthouse. And I, with that, I'm going to pop over to the chat and see if we have any questions or any comments that people would like to uh, pop in. Oh, okay. That was just somebody helping me out with my um, with my presentation in the midst of my technology and issue. And thank you, Lindsay, for trying to help me through that. <laughs> Do we have any questions at all, or are there any comments that people would like to make? I hope we had such a nice turnout, and I'm so glad that you all showed up tonight. And we will have several other sessions this year on different topics, and uh, I'm hoping to see a lot of uh, repeat participants. Any questions at all? Okay, well, thank you very much. And if you have any questions at all that you'd like to follow up with me about, you can always find me at my website, which is www.combseducationalconsulting.com. Uh, and you can contact me through that website. And again, I believe that we, I, I am recording the session, so I will be sending that to Bobby. So if you know uh, parents who were not able to participate live with us tonight, but might be interested in the topic, um, I'm sure there will be a way for you to, um, uh, for them to view that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a great night.